All right, so I guess we're getting started. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Eric. I work at CoreOS on our Kubernetes upstream team. So uh, I work on Kubernetes. I do a lot of container stuff and have been for a while. So today's talk uh, is called Containers from Scratch. Um, and the first thing I want everyone to do is think about what was the first time that you ever were introduced to a container? Like, what did you do? What was that experience like? All that kind of stuff. Um, maybe it was this morning, which would be awesome. Uh, but for me, um, this was my first introduction to containers. So this was um, back when Docker was this uh, open source project by a company called DotCloud. Docker had this interactive way that you learned how to use Docker. It was like this terminal in a website. Um, it's no longer alive anymore, but if you do archive, uh, if you do the web archive, you can actually interact with this and some of the JavaScript still works. But, um, you know, it is sort of, slide gives a good representation of sort of in the three and a half, four years that I've been working with containers, I've always used Docker. I eventually started using Rocket a little bit. I've used Kubernetes, but I never actually had to think about how that worked, right? Docker is amazing. You, you run Ubuntu or something like that, and you have this little mini virtual machine. But I never, even as a, you know, someone who works on and with containers, I never really had to learn how they worked. So today, uh, we're gonna take a little bit of deep dive, and it's gonna be sort of in the mantra of this TED talk from a while back. And if you can't see the title, it's about a guy who goes and decides to build the toaster. Uh, and the way that he builds the toaster um, is he like, you know, goes and mines some ore and goes and puts together some wiring. And uh, today, um, we're gonna build our metaphorical toaster, right? Um, but we're gonna be building a container today. And uh, instead of using sort of high-level tools like Docker or Rocket, um, the goal of today is to be building containers from scratch. So today, we're not gonna be using Docker, we're not gonna be using Rocket, we're not gonna be using LXC, we're not gonna be using systemd and spawn or the litmus of other things that you can do to run a container. Um, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be trying to go back to basics and learn about what actually a container is. So everyone with me on that? So unfortunately, uh, we don't get to talk about container technologies immediately. Uh, we have to talk about what a container image is. Uh, when you uh, issue a Docker pull or you put a image URL in a Kubernetes manifest, what is that referring to? What is that? Um, as my coworker Redbeard would say, um, it's a tarball. Containers are just tarballs. Um, you know, they're packaged up files, and that tarball contains two main things. One it contains your app metadata, right? So this is like what environment variables should we expose to your application? I don't know, what port it runs on? When I run your container, what is like the path to Nginx that I need to execute to, to run it? Um, and then it has your file system. And for anybody who's built a container, the way you build a container is you say, uh, from Ubuntu, or if you're cool, you go from Alpine or something like that. Um, and then you go ahead and you add your app that you've cross-compiled for Linux or something like that, and that is your file system? What is that? Uh, what happens when you say from Ubuntu? Um, and the answer is it's something that kind of looks like an operating system, right? You're clearly not downloading a kernel. There's no init system, or for God's sake, you should not be running an init system in your container. <laughs> um, but what is that? So today, to start off, we are gonna be building a little, uh, something that looks like an operating system. And we're gonna be using a very advanced tool to do this. Um, that's called DNF. Now, DNF is the package manager for Fedora, right? Um, or it's the replacement for Yum. Um, and you can sort of think of this as something like apt-get, if you're more familiar with it. It's not quite like Baru, and we're gonna see why in a second. But all we're gonna do is we're gonna make a root file system, and this is where our demo and all our little fun today is gonna live. And the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna say DNF install in this root file system. And the first thing that DNF is gonna do, it's gonna look around and say, wow, you have very few things in here. You want me to install Python? You don't have anything in here. And what DNF is going to do 
is it's going to install a ton of dependencies in there, and it's going to build up something that looks like an operating system. So um, unfortunately, running that command is kind of hard on conference Wi-Fi, <laughs> so I have the, you know, out of the oven thing. And when we look at the root file system, uh, first off, can everyone see that, or should I make that bigger? Sounds great. So what do we see in here? Well, we see things that look like an operating system, right? We have some shared libraries, um, you know, to run Python and whatnot. Uh, we have a bin with a bunch of things that look like bin, and this is all bin DNF, right? I haven't touched this, promise. I didn't like build this off an existing image or something. It's just DNF saying installing stuff. So the very first thing we're gonna do for containerization is we're gonna um, trap our process inside of the root file system, right? If you've worked with containers, you've heard of the Chiroot, right? What Chiroot is, is Chiroot is a system call. It takes exactly one argument, which is a directory. You are telling the Linux kernel and say, hey, I want my view of the file system to start at this directory, and that's it. And conveniently for this demo, we have uh, lots of Linux systems provide a nice little tool that wraps to root the system call, which is conveniently called to root. <laughs> so we're going to go over here, and we're going to go sudo to root uh, the root file system, and then we're going to say bin bash. And when I say bin bash, of course I mean rootfs bin bash, right? I don't mean bin bash on my machine. And what do we do immediately? Well, uh, now I think, or my process thinks, that the start of the world starts at my container. Cool, right? Um, for instance, if I do like which Python 3, bin Python 3 actually refers to rootfs Python 3. So we have a container, right? Or something that feels like a container. Um, lots of you will also know this is absolutely not a container. Um, and the way that we're gonna show this is, oh, we gotta, do some magic mounting, psaux, and that's going to dump everything on my machine, right? Uh, you can see my GPG agent. Um, you could see Chrome in here if you're going in here. One day I like fear that I'm going to do this demo. There's going to be some virus on there, and somebody. Was gonna like but if I run, for instance, a top in my other terminal, and I go back to the one inside of the Chiroot, um, and I grep for top. I can easily see that, or let me push that to the top for those, right? Uh, what's more, because I had to issue the chroot command using sudo, um, I can go ahead and kill that top command, <laughs> and outside of my container, the top command dies, right? Pretty bad. So this is where we talk about namespaces, right? Uh, namespaces are like chroots, but they are ways of creating unique views of other types of systems. Uh, you can do this for, we're gonna do process trees for this demo. Um, you can do some like network interfaces, have a unique view of all the network interfaces on the system. You can also do this for mounted volumes. Um, the system calls that you use to create these are clone and unshare. Uh, we're gonna be using unshare a lot today. Unshare is a system call where you pass it the uh, sort of flag bits of the namespaces that you wanna create. So you can say, I wanna create a new process uh, namespace and I wanna create a new network namespace. You call unshare and the thing that unshare does is the next time you fork, that child will be in these new namespaces. And conveniently, um, just like Chiroot, we have a nice little system call or a nice little bash utility called unshare that will call unshare for us. So we're gonna do sudo unshare dash p saying I wanna create a new um, process namespace. Um, we're gonna do mount proc, fs proc. What this will do is it'll remount the proc file system inside of my new process namespace. Um, and then we're gonna fork, because we need to fork in order to, for the new next child to create it, um, to root rootfs bin bash. So just to break that down again, create a new process namespace, uh, remount the proc file system inside that uh, file namespace, or the process namespace, fork, then to root. And what's the result here? Well, I still, you know, have my Python and all this kind of stuff. Um, but when I psaux, um, what do I see? I think my bash is process ID one, uh, which is 
Weird, right? That's normally the init system. But because we've created this process namespace, we've created a unique mapping for my process tree that thinks that the world starts with me, right? So containers have this sort of similar idea. You can't see anything outside because you can just see your individual process tree starting when you call done share. Of course, on the host, um, if I go ahead and look for that shell, I can still see that that is definitely not process ID one, right? So we're creating a unique mapping where the things inside the namespace think that they are the only thing and the host can still see everything. Cool. A very important part about namespaces is that they're composable, right? Um, a really good example of this is a Kubernetes pod. A Kubernetes pod, you are gonna have multiple processes with different cheroots but they're going to be sharing the same network and mount namespace. This is cool because you can do things like talk to each other over local host where you don't necessarily need to be sharing uh, a process namespace, right? I don't actually need to be able to see the other processes to be talking to them over the network. And the system call we're gonna be using for this is called setNS, right? What setNS does is it says, setNS does <laughs> is it, um, is it, allows me to say for my individual process, enter this particular namespace. Cool. And this is also where we have to say, well, how do I pass things to set NS, right? What, what do I pass? And the answer is that the way that, um, the way that the Linux kernel exposes namespaces is it's right under proc. So if I do ls proc and this PID that I, for my uh, container, dash ns, what I'll see is a bunch of files. These are files provided and filled in by the kernel that represent the mount namespace, the network namespace, PID namespace, user namespace, so on and so on and so forth, right? So we're gonna be calling set, set ns and we're gonna be giving it a file descriptor that's when we, when we, that we open from here. So like our other demos, set ns has a very nicely uh, a nice little uh, bash utility that we're gonna use. Um, it is conveniently called uh, nsenter, not set ns. But nsenter, we wanna enter the PID namespace for the container, right? So we do proc uh, dash ns PID. We're gonna enter the mount namespace that we created when we remounted proc. Proc nsmt, and then we're gonna call to root rootfs bin bash. You can see some trends <laughs> developing here. Oh no, program working directly. I don't know why you have to add that there, but yeah. Cool, what do we see now? Um, I have now entered that process namespace. Pretty cool, right? So even though I am in a different terminal, I have just entered the namespace for my container. This is incredibly useful when debugging containers, by the way. If you want to figure out why the heck your container cannot talk to the internet, execute nsenter, NS and then in the network namespace, you all still have all of your available tooling, and then try to debug the network there. And of course, I can run top in this command, psaux, can see the top, um, and just because you know we do this a lot. Oh, eight we can kill the top because we're now in the same namespace, process namespace. Um, so a very common thing for Docker or uh, Kubernetes is to mount volumes from your host into a particular namespace, or into a to root, excuse me. So um, if you attach the dash V flag for Docker, for instance, right, what that will do is it will create some sort of mapping between a host volume that you have and some volume inside the namespace. Now, the roots are relatively immutable, right? Or at least the containers are supposed to be relatively immutable. But you can do this, like in Kubernetes, to inject um, configuration files, secrets, so on and so forth. So uh, the way that we do that is we just create this thing called a bind mount. Now, if we try to do something like a symlink, um, symlinks are just names that refer to other names, right? Um, which is a problem if I'm in a root because that name might not go anywhere if it's mapped to a host directory. So we can just call uh, nsenter into the mount namespace for my, um, my container. Now this is a, a bit of a, 
a, a big one, but basically what it says is we're going to mount read-only some directory called read-only files into my root file system, right? And what this should be doing is it should be creating a mapping um, that my container can see that I can modify on the host without my container being able to modify it, right? So if we go back over here, um, you might have to sudo, oh God, I killed it. We're gonna have to find that container again, that process again, one second. Uh, exit, psaux. This is the problem with live demos is that it relies on me to have the ability to write these commands. Okay, so uh, this is the PID. PID equals that. And then we're just gonna run this one. So um, I have a read-only files directory, and it says hello core, from, you know, core SFS. And we're gonna mount that into the container without the container being able to modify it. So run this command. And then where is that gonna show up in my container? Can anyone tell me? slash clear ls var read only files hello i can cat this out um, but i can't write to it reasonable so uh, all of these things we've been talking today are about um, preventing the views of particular processes from seeing other things, right? So I'm preventing my process, my container, from being able to see uh, network namespace or network interfaces or something else. Uh, but what I'm not doing is actually restricting certain things about the way that the container can operate. You can, with all the stuff that we've been building up to so far, you can still nuke a machine by just taking up too much memory, right? So C groups, um, which some of you probably have heard of. Um, are a way of limiting the resource consumption by some set of processes, right? And we're gonna be using this to take our container and actually reduce the amount of memory and restrict that it can use. So the way that, um, the way that C groups are exposed to you as the, the programmer from the, the kernel is in a, another one of these magic directories called sysfs cgroup. What sysfs cgroup is that it has a bunch of different kinds of cgroups. So it'll have stuff like a, a memory cgroup, I don't know, a CPU cgroup, so on and so forth. And in order to create, so for this demo, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a cgroup, right? And the way that you create a cgroup, and in our case, we're gonna create a memory cgroup, is we're gonna make a directory. So fs cgroup memory demo. Right, so we already have the directory called memory, and then within that directory, we're gonna create a, another one called demo. Um, and then the kernel, nice and nicely, is gonna fill that in with a bunch of files that I can use to actually control my particular C group, right? So we have stuff like, I don't know, um, limiting the number of TCP bytes or something like that. Um, and what I wanna do right now is I am actually want to assign my current process into that C group. Okay, the way that we do that is we ex echo, we write our own PID into the tasks file for this particular C group, right? So we have in the memory C group, we've created a sub, C, a sub memory C group called demo. That has a tax file which keep track of all the processes in that C group. And if we write a new process, we will actually be entering that C group. So if I've done this correctly, I am now in the memory demo C group, um, and I can see that by saying proc self C group, uh, and in fact, I am in the memory the demo C group. Cool. Now, uh, the next thing we wanna do is restrict the amount of memory that this C group can use, so we'll go ahead and echo um, a really big number, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Uh, so this is about into sys fs C group memory demo, uh, memory usage, uh, usage in bytes, right? How much, how many bytes is that about in human terms? Can anyone tell me? It's about 100 megabytes. Cool. Um, what are you doing? 
No. Write invalid error. This is why we have these. Memory limit in bytes. Limit in bytes, sorry. Usage is the amount that my thing is using. Cool, and then we're gonna also um, memory swappiness. We're gonna turn off swappiness. You can see where this demo might be going, right? So we're gonna turn off swap, so I, can, I won't use disk once I run out of memory. We now have this nice little program called Hungry. What does this program do? Uh, it eats up memory, cool. And it prints out a little bit of the memory that's using every single time. So if I've done this correctly, I've entered the, the C group, I have set certain limitations around that C group, and if I run this, uh, it won't blow up my computer and we can continue the presentation. Cool. Mm, there we go. So what we've done there is we've actually restricted the amount of memory that a particular C group can use. Cool. So a big problem we have here is now how do we keep processes from reassigning C groups, right? Um, C groups are something that you just mount in, they're very much like proc, and the answer is more namespaces, cool. So there is such a thing as a C group namespace, so we can create a C group namespace. What we're gonna do is we're gonna run unshare, C for C group, um, and then if we go ahead and look at proc self C group, we now think that we're in the root memory C group, and if we were to remount all of these uh, C group special file systems, we would not see the demo C group because we are in a different uh, namespace. Cool. Um, a very important part about all these demos is how do you clean up and exit the C, C group? Um, this is something that a lot of uh, tutorials gloss over. Um, the, the answer is you reassign your C group, FS C group memory tasks, so I'm gonna re-enter the, the main one. Oh wait, I might have to rerun this. Um, and then once there are no more tasks in the demo C group, um, I can do arm dir sys fs c group memory demo. Cool. Um, do not use rm dash rm dash r. I've done that a million times and was confused about all the errors that it threw. Cool. <laughs> and there are some fancier demos you can do. You can like remount it in the c group file system, and stuff will happen. Cool. Um, so now we get to talk about security. Um, there's this really great quote <laughs> by Dan Walsh. Walsh. Um, so all of these things that we've had to be doing, are, we have to have been giving the processes root. As the quote says, Docker and containers in general are a great way of downloading other people's code and running them as root. So how do we combat that in a general way? Containers sort of require root, you can do stuff like you know, change the user once you're in the container, but a lot of people don't do that. So what do we, what do, we do to make this better? Um, so this, is, this section is actually about security as a general concept. Um, there are a lot of technologies that we could have covered. So we could have covered SE Linux, SecComp, AppArmor. I swear I tried to get an SE Linux demo going. <laughs> um, it was, you know, these are maybe not the easiest things to demo, um, but we're gonna be talking about capabilities right now. So um, first off, if I exit back to my normal user, and I have this particular program that's written in Go, what happens when I try to run this program as my user? Anybody know? Oh, listen. Um, and the answer is, clear, temp, listen. I get a permission denied, right? Because I cannot list on, on port 80, I'm an unprivileged user. Um, now, I could just run sudo temp listen, but that's bad, right? Because I don't want to actually give my application sudo just so I can listen on port 80. So this is where capabilities come in. What capabilities are is there's this long list of things that sort of comprise what sudo, the powers of sudo. And you can arbitrarily add and remove these from processes. So in our case, we're gonna do run this particular command, which is gonna be set cap, net cap 
cap net bind service, which is the uh, capability that I need to run on port 80. Uh, and then we're going to keep going. And then temp, listen, success. Cool. So what I've done is I've actually given this get cap, uh, get cap, temp, listen. I've given this the one capability that it needs to perform its action, right? This is incredibly better than giving it sudo, right? Now the problem is if I go and I become root and I do cap sh print, this will print all of my capabilities. And what is this going to print? It's going to print a lot of things, right? This is sort of all the capabilities that I can do. You have crazy things like being able to change the system time, <laughs> cap wake alarm, uh, and the dreaded uh, cap sys admin where all of the things that don't go in the other ones go. So what I actually want to do is rather than giving permissions to my container, I want to be taking them away, right? I want to say, hey, you can do these basic things, but you can't do these other ones. So the way we can, do, we can show that is we can actually just um, drop certain capabilities and for this demo, we'll be dropping cap chunk, chunk. Is that how you pronounce that? Chunk, yeah, cool. <laughs> Best, you know, talks are a very interesting time for you to determine if you're pronouncing any of these words right, um, which I have been wrong so many times. <laughs> cool, so uh, I'm still root, right? Um, and I still have a lot of capabilities, but uh, let's say I make a file called foo, and I try to change the ownership back to me, Eric, the, the, the unprivileged user, um, you're going to see that even though I'm root, because I don't have that one capability, I can't perform that action. And for containers, what this means is that when you run a container, even though it's running as root, you want to be restricting all of the things that it can do that it has no business needing to do. Does your system, you know, does it need to change the system clock? Does it need to do X, Y, or Z? If the answer is no, remove that capability and let your container run as root but without all this extra stuff. And all of the other things like SE Linux, uh, AppArm or SecComp are sort of similar things that either can do very fine grain permissioning like SE Linux or like uh, SecComp can actually reduce the number of system calls that your container can make. Present. Um, I don't know much about networking. Networking is a beautiful, magical thing that I just sort of work with and it works occasionally and I'm happy. Um, so this is gonna be a really quick demo, <laughs> but we're gonna be doing a little bit of a demo of network namespaces. Now, um, just like any of our other demos, we're gonna be creating a namespace. Um, so in this case, we're gonna be doing, oh, I'm like so many shells deep, um, sudo unshare. And for network, um, to root, rootfs, and bin bash is optional. Um, and now when I look at all of my devices, I see exactly one. That's actually down is the best part. So I have a, uh, a loop back. Yeah, I have a loop back, and that's it. So I actually can't communicate with anything right now because I just have a loop back. I could turn it on and communicate with myself, which would be kind of sad. Um, but the next thing we're going to be doing is trying to create connectivity between my container and my host. You can do more complicated things, and Kubernetes and lots of other, you know, you should be at the Tagera talk if you want to hear about this. Um, but a very simple one that we're going to be doing is we're going to be trying to set up a virtual Ethernet pair. We're going to create two, v0 uh, and v1. We're going to inject v0 or v1 into my namespace, and we're gonna be configuring it with ethconfig, and hopefully what this will do is, because virtual uh, ethernet pairs sort of are like, you, whatever goes in this end goes out this end, hopefully we will have given our container an IP address. So uh, demo gods be with me, and let's hope this works. Pseudo su, so we create the virtual ethernet pair. Um, I have to, again, find my container, apologies bin bash, okay, um, sure, that's it, pid equals it, um, and then we're going to inject the first beef one into the container, cool, so one end of the, the ethernet pair, I think that worked, yay, okay, so one end is in there, and the other end is out on my host, uh, we then configure 
v0 outside. We configure v1 inside the container. Um, my PAAR, cool, so that's up. And if I do Python 3 and serve, um, I should be able to hit this here. Cool. So I have now given my container an IP. Awesome. Uh, please don't ask any questions about this. Uh, the last one we're going to be talking about is uh, user namespaces. User namespaces are really cool. Um, what they are is they're mapping of UIDs from on the host into the container. Uh, user namespaces are sort of seen as like the next evolution of containers. Um, and that's mostly because you can sort of act as root without having root, which is kind of cool. And we're going to just give a little demo of how that works. So I have to exit my many containers, um, and then I'm going to do umchair mount root user. What this is going to do is it's going to do a little magic, um, and it's going to create a new user namespace for me, and then map my UID to root inside of the container. Nope, that's not the <laughs> that's not map root user root user. Um, so here's a question: Did I type sudo once? No. Um, who am I? Oh. We're going to root rootfs. Who am I? I'm root. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Don't worry. Um, proc self UID map. You can see that I've actually mapped my user to root inside the container. Um, am I actually root? I have a lot of capabilities. And funny enough, I was able to run to root. So what's the deal here? Well, the answer is you're not root at all. Um, you internally think that you're root inside the container, but externally, um, like if I were to run Python 3, HTTP serve, and try to do port 80, I'm going to get a permission denied. Even though I have that capability inside of the container, I think I do. As soon as I interact with the host or the global options, um, I'm going to hit some setbacks. And this is sort of why um, user namespaces are really, really cool and have their applications, but probably aren't the next thing that is going to be like in everybody's Kubernetes cluster, right? Um, so you still need a lot of permissions on the host. Some obvious ones is that in order to even unpack the tarball, like to create dev files, you need root. Um, to deal with C groups, you need root. Uh, to listen on lower ports, you need root. So I don't think we built a toaster today. Um, we definitely did some things, and I hope they were slightly you know, educational or fun at least. Um, but the conclusion I want to take away is that containers are actually just a bunch of technologies provided by the Linux kernel. Um, container runtimes, Docker, Rocket, all these type of stuff, are nice tricks that wrap these options in some configuration, right? So they're the things moving around the tarballs, they're the things sort of setting up your defaults. Um, but ultimately, the underlying technologies are really powerful, and it's going to help you a lot if you understand them for debugging containers and that kind of thing. Um, of course, this talk was me ripping off a lot of people who've done a lot cooler work than me. So you should go check out these particular links that I will post up on Twitter afterwards. Uh, Namespaces and Operations is a great sort of tutorial that goes into a lot of these concepts. Um, Building Minimal Containers by Brian, Redgr uh, by Brian Redbeard, our MC today, is an awesome talk about how you actually build that root file system. What tools could you use instead of Docker build? Um, the C groups documentation in the kernel was the only reasonable C groups documentation I could find. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Jesse Frizzell has a great blog on unprivileged containers and possibly their uses outside of things like um, Docker. Also, all the Linux man pages for these type of technologies are awesome. Uh, go read them because they're actually quite good. Um, thanks. And we're actually hiring for my team. So uh, if you want to come work on upstream Kubernetes, even if you're remote, Come talk to me afterwards. Thanks. We have a few minutes of that for questions, as long as they're not work up about network namespaces. 
And if not, awesome. Uh, thanks, everybody, for showing up. And I'll tweet this out if anybody wants the slides. Thanks.